Last week at the Time Center here in New York City, L2 hosted a clinic on how digital is impacting consumer behavior. We were especially impressed with the presentation and discussion with Seth Stevens Davidowitz, author of Everybody Lies. Seth's research explores the hidden truths that our Google searches and Facebook posts reveal about us. Enjoy. We'll see you in two weeks. I study what we can learn about the human psyche from internet behavior, uh, from people's internet behavior. Uh, but I'm going to start with a story that doesn't have to do with the internet or people. It's a story of a horse. This is American Pharaoh. Uh, in 2015, he became the first horse in 37 years to win the Triple Crown. But when he was a one-year-old horse and he was up for an auction in upstate New York, uh, he didn't look like a special horse. Nobody really knew that there was anything spectacular about American Pharaoh. Uh, nobody knew that American Pharaoh was a special horse except for this guy, uh, Jeff Sater. And Jeff Sater uh, is a guy with three degrees from Harvard. And when he was 26 years old, he was working at Citibank. And he looked at himself in a, a three-piece suit in a mirror and said, this isn't me, and quit his job at Citibank, moved to rural Pennsylvania, decided he was going to work with horses and particularly, he was going to study what makes a great racehorse great. Uh, and he knew how he wanted to do it. He was going to do it with data science, with trying to create data, big data sets uh, that could correlate horse performance with various attributes and figure out what really matters and what doesn't matter. And for years, his uh, project was a bit of a failure. He started by measuring uh, his first approach to predicting what makes a great racehorse great was he measured the size of horses' nostrils. He figured big nostrils would allow them to breathe better. Breath better. Uh, he, he created the world's largest, still to this day, the world's largest horse nostril database ever created. <laughs> and correlated that with uh, eventual how, how the horses eventually did. And he found out that did not work. It did not predict uh, racehorse success. Uh, he measured the size of their uh, muscles, put kind of rulers around their legs. This maybe made a little more sense. Uh, correlated that with eventual outcomes. Uh, found out again that did not predict uh, racehorse success. He was an eccentric, kind of a weird guy. I met him in Florida. He once measured the size of horses' defecations. He sat outside while the, before they raced and kind of uh, measured uh, how big their poop was. It wasn't a stroke of genius. It didn't work uh, as well. Uh, then one day, he decided he was going to build an ultrasound, the world's first ever horse ultrasound, to measure the internal organs of horses. And he could use this to measure uh, many of the or their organs, including the size of uh, various attributes of their horse, of their hearts. And he found that the left ventricle, when he correlated the left ventricle uh, with eventual horsing success, uh, horse success, how many races they won, that was a massive predictor of uh, how well the horses uh, turned out. Uh, so when American Pharaoh was one years old, he was up for an auction. Jeff Sater was, invest was uh, consulting with a client. And he showed me this card he had about American Pharaoh when he was one years old. Uh, he noted, like everybody else, that he had about average height, 56 percentile, about average weight, uh, a little bit better than average pedigree, nothing too special about American Pharaoh except, of course, for his left ventricle, uh, which was 99.61st percentile left ventricle. Actually, among uh, horses with left ventricles that big, most of them have diseases. Their other organs are all tiny, and they have an enlarged left ventricle. But with American Pharaoh, all his organs were pretty big, and his left ventricle was enormous. Uh, so he told his, his uh, client, uh, basically, this is a once-in-a-generation horse, uh, obviously a successful uh, prediction. So there are a few lessons for data scientists in this story uh, that, I take, that I take from Jeff Sater's story. The first one is uh, the frequently the value of a data set is not how big it is. It's its, it's newness, that you have something new that nobody else has. Uh, if you think of Jeff Sater's uh, data set, it was about tens of thousands of horses. In the world of big data, uh, where companies have billions or tens of billions of data points, a uh, data set of tens of thousands of horses that can fit an Excel spreadsheet uh, maybe may, won't be so impressive, but it actually got the job done. But Jeff Sater's genius was to go out and get new data that other people didn't have, uh, including building the first horse ultrasound to do this. Uh, you have to fail a lot on the way. Uh, you don't wake up with the left ventricle. You try a lot of things and fail over and over again, maybe for decades before you eventually find the big winner. 
And I think more importantly and really exciting for people uh, in the field of data science is there are left ventricles out there. There are things that if you know that about, uh, about a customer or whoever, whatever you're trying to measure, your model cannot be 10% better, cannot be 20% better. You might have a model 10 times better just because you know one thing about uh, people or horses or whatever it is that other people don't know. So uh, the obvious question is what are the left ventricles waiting to be found? And I think there are, whatever industry you're in, uh, there are left ventricles waiting to be found if you kind of follow this entrepreneurial process. Uh, but of course, you're not in the business of studying horses, you're in the business of studying people. And when you study people, you have to keep in mind that everybody lies, which is the title of my book and the focus of my research for the last five years. Uh, so my favorite example, a little R-rated, just to spice up the, con the conference a little bit, uh, is sexuality. This is the general social survey, the biggest sociological survey in the United States every two years put out by the University of Chicago. They ask Americans how frequently they have sex, uh, whether they use a condom, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual sex. Uh, so you can do the math on this. Women say they average sex about once a week, use a condom 20% of the time. Uh, this adds up in heterosexual sex. This adds up to 1.1 billion condoms reported by women using heterosexual sexual encounters. Uh, do the exact same questions as the general social survey does for men. Do the exact same math, and men report 1.6 billion condoms uh, used in heterosexual sex every year. This is Americans uh, annually. And of course, you see, by definition, those, those have to be the same. So we kind of already know that uh, somebody's lying. So who's telling the truth, men or women? Uh, neither. Nielsen uh, calculates all the condoms sold every year. Only 600 million <laughs> condoms are sold every year, some used by gay men, some thrown out. So basically, everybody now is lying about sex, uh, men just more than women. Uh, we have a new approach to understanding the human psyche, and that's people's Google searches. When people are online, when they're alone, they're more honest. And more importantly, with Google, you have an incentive to be honest, to get the information you need. And uh, we can analyze this data. I call Google searches digital truth serum because people tell Google things that they might not tell to friends, family members, uh, surveys, doctors, market researchers, uh, many other sources. Uh, and I think the kind of the main approach to understand people's surveys are going to lose ground and be sup at the least supplemented by uh, Google data, which is Google Trends, public data source, anonymous and aggregate searches that everyone makes. You can compare them across time, across place. And uh, when you analyze Google Trends data, as I've been doing for the last five years, uh, you get a different picture of people than you do from other sources. So uh, there are more searches for porn than weather, uh, which is, I think, diff if you ask people in a survey, about 20% of men and 4% of women admit to watching porn, which is very hard to reconcile with this data. I think 100% admit to checking the weather. But uh, <laughs> uh, so definitely a different, uh, a different view of people, and I think in many ways a more honest uh, view of people on Google than you're going to get from any other source. Uh, and Google Trends has proven itself better than surveys for measuring many, many uh, outcomes uh, when, when we kind of have some ground truth to compare itself. So predicting who will turn out and vote, uh, you can't really predict turnout in election by asking people, are you going to vote? If you ask people before an election, are you going to vote? Uh, more than 50% of people who don't vote tell surveys they're going to vote. But you can predict with great accuracy where turnout's going to be high based on people searching how to vote, where to vote, polling places. Uh, in the weeks before an election. Uh, predicting who is at risk of suicide. I'm working on a, a New York Times column about this right now. And the predictive power in Google uh, for suicide, people searching really, really disturbing stuff on Google, how to kill, kill yourself, kill yourself, suicide, commit suicide, very, very high, much higher than uh, surveys asking people if they have suicidal ideation. So uh, dis uh, disturbing, but maybe hopefully uh, could be used by mental health professionals uh, for some sort of intervention. Uh, measuring racism. This is how I started the research. I was doing my PhD in economics, and I uh, found Google Trends and became obsessed with it. And one of the first things I did was to see uh, to measure racism in the United States. And I was shocked by what the data showed me on Google searches about racism. If you ask people in a survey, are you racist, 99.5% uh, of Americans said, no, no, of course not. And I found that on Google, people are making racist searches with disturbing frequency. This is the percent of Google searches 
that include the N word, not the N word, but like not the N word, but like the actual N word. And uh, darker red means a higher percent of searches. Again, it's it's percent of searches, so it's not because places are bigger or have higher populations or use Google uh, more. Uh, in the time period I was looking for, people were searching uh, this with about the same frequency. They were searching Migraine and Lakers and Daily Show and Economist, so it wasn't a fringe search. It was millions of searches every year. The real divide in racism these days, if you look at this map closely, is not necessarily north versus south. It's much, much more east versus west, where you see it gets a lot lower as you get to the western part of the country. Anyway, I uh, published this. And I tried to publish this, I kept on getting rejected. Everyone's like, this is so stupid. Why are you analyzing Google searches? It was kind of considered weird uh, back in the day. And then uh, and we th uh, when I was doing this, there was this idea we lived in a post-racial society. And uh, you know, this extreme racism was a thing of the past. And then, of course, we had a presidential candidate uh, who said some very racially charged things. And everyone thought he was going to fall apart, and he didn't. So Nate Cohn, he's a data journalist at the New York Times. Uh, he asked me during Trump's rise uh, to send over the racism data that I'd collected. And he, he, want, he had a data set of support for Trump in different parts of the country. He wanted to see if they were correlated. And he found it was the single highest correlation of anything he could find. Nate Silver reported the same thing, that Google searches, racist searches, were the single highest correlation with support for Trump in the Republican primary, higher than economic variables or ideology or anything else you could measure. I make a big distinction between uh, Google searches or search data, which is digital truth serum, where people are so honest, and uh, another huge data set, Facebook data set, which I think is much less honest, uh, not just than Google, but even than, than anonymous surveys. Uh, I call Facebook digital brag to my friends about how good my life is serum, because uh, <laughs> people aren't really confessing their secrets to Facebook. They're trying to show off to their friends. And we see this over and over again, that Facebook data doesn't really correspond with reality. Uh, so you can compare, for example, two magazines, the National Enquirer, trashy, gossipy uh, magazine, and the Atlantic, an intellectual, philosophical, poetic magazine. And we actually know how popular uh, these two magazines are. We have circulation data uh, on these magazines. And uh, according to the Alliance for Audited Media, uh, the National Enquirer actually sells more copies than the Atlantic every year by about a factor of three. So uh, it's the more popular magazine. Uh, but if you look at Facebook data, Facebook likes data, where people are bragging to their friends about how good their lives are, uh, you get a very different picture of the popularity of these two magazines, where uh, the Atlantic Monthly is 45 times more popular uh, than the National Enquirer, because, of course, people want their friends to think they're so intellectual. Uh, I like to compare the two different data sources, big data sources, uh, Facebook, Social, the digital brag to my friends about how good my life is data and the Google digital truth serum data. So this is how people describe their husbands on social media and on search. Uh, starting with social media, the top way people complete, complete the phrase, my husband is, uh, my husband is, number one, is the best. Uh, number two, my best friend, amazing, the greatest, and so cute. Uh, so very, very nice view of marriage on, uh, according to social media. Uh, what happens on Google when people aren't broadcasting their marriage to the world, but actually trying to get uh, information? Uh, it turns out the third descriptor on Google of husbands, which I found actually very surprising, but uh, cute, is actually amazing. So that one kind of checks out uh, as a reasonable uh, description of husbands. But the other, rounding out the top five on Google, are a gay, a jerk, annoying, and mean. <laughs> I think that a lot of the data uh, analysis I've shown you so far is kind of just presenting how the world is, where racism is highest, or uh, where magazines are more popular, or uh, how people describe, describe their husbands. But I think uh, the ultimate power of this data is to change the world and improve the world. And this is maybe my favorite example of a stu my favorite study that I've done, because I think it does have so much potential to improve the world, is a study of Islamophobia. And on Google, a lot of people make some really, really nasty searches about Muslim Americans. Not a lot of people, but not a trivial number, uh, you know, thousands. Uh, make really, really nasty searches about Muslims. They search things like kill Muslims, or I hate Muslims, or Muslims must die, or Muslims are terrorists. Uh, really, really nasty, horrible searches uh, by people in a really angry frame of mind. Uh, sometimes the searches are late at night, and uh, you know, not the most necessarily sane members of society making these searches. And these seem kind of like such weird searches. Do they have any information in them when people are searching something like kill Muslims? Why is someone even searching that? You know, they're so enraged. 
Well, they actually do because we see when, when these searches are higher, when more people are searching for kill Muslims, and I hate Muslims, uh, there are more hate crimes against Muslims. So uh, Muslims are much more at risk. Uh, these same searches kind of translate uh, days or weeks, uh, d days later into attacks on Muslim Americans. Uh, and there was one particular period where Islamophobic surges have been problematic over the last uh, few years, but there was one particular period where Islamophobic surges really got out of control. It was in December 2015 after the San Bernardino attacks, if you remember that, where two Muslim Americans shot up uh, a group of one of his coworkers. Uh, and immediately after this attack, there was a huge rise in these nasty searches. The number one search about Muslims on Google right after the attack was kill Muslims. So people were kind of, in America, there were a lot of people that were enraged and, saying, and doing some really nasty stuff, predict, and these predict that hate crimes were going to be higher. So a few days uh, after the San Bernardino attack, I think Barack Obama knew that, uh, that Islamophobia was becoming problematic, so he gave a speech uh, about not just uh, terrorism, about stopping terrorism, but also about stopping Islamophobia, uh, filled with great moving poetic lines, the responsibility of all Americans to reject discrimination, how is our responsibility not to give in to fear, to appeal to freedom, how is our responsibility to let in everybody in this country, no matter their religious background, all the things that Americans should do and who we are and, uh, and stuff. And I was doing research uh, during this speech on Islamophobia and Google searches you can break down minute by minute. So I wanted to see what happened during and after this speech to all these nasty searches about Muslim Americans. And I looked at the data, and I found out that uh, for Islamophobic searches during and after the speech, I found out that not only did the searches not drop, they didn't stay the same, they shot way up. So there are more people searching kill Muslims, and I hate Muslim, no Syrian refugees, less positive searches about Muslim Americans, and this was kind of staying the same for, for long after the speech. Uh, so this is a pretty pessimistic conclusion, uh, the idea that even a beautiful speech by Obama that we think is helping people and that uh, you know, sounds like it's doing all the right things, actually could be backfiring. Uh, but there was one more, maybe more optimistic conclusion in this speech. Uh, at the end of the speech, uh, Barack Obama said that Muslim Americans are friends and neighbors, they are sports heroes, and they're the men and women who will die for this country. And you see right after this line, uh, there is a huge rise in searches for Muslim athletes and Muslim soldiers. In fact, the top descriptor of Muslims for the first time in many years on Google was not Muslim terrorists or Muslim extremists, it was Muslim athletes followed by Muslim soldiers, and those kept the top spot for about a week afterwards. And you saw around the internet people, young men were saying, oh, Shaquille O'Neal's Muslim, Muhammad Ali's Muslim, they didn't know these things. And so I kind of thought that uh, there was maybe a difference. If you kind of think of the two different approaches, what didn't work and what did work, I think what didn't work is lecturing people, talking about responsibility, things they should do, giving them information they've been told a thousand times before. And what maybe is more effective is subtly provoking their curiosity, changing the way they think of the group that's causing them so much rage. And uh, so we, I, I published it, we published this in the New York Times, the New York Times column. I don't think it's crazy when you write something in the New York Times that powerful people read it, maybe even someone in the president's staff, because a few days later, Obama gave another speech, this time in a Baltimore mosque. And again, it was on national TV. Again, it got a lot of attention. But you saw that uh, Barack Obama's strategy in this speech was very different. There was no talk of responsibility, no talk of what people should do, no talk, of, no, none of the lectures and sermons that people have told a thousand people have been told a thousand times before. He really doubled down, or tripled down, or quadrupled down on the curiosity strategy, where he said that Muslim Americans are farmers and merchants. Muslim Americans. Uh, help build the, the skyscrapers of Chicago. Thomas Jefferson had a copy of the Quran in his office. Uh, really all kinds of new information changing how people think of this group causing them so much rage. And I checked uh, what happened to all these nasty search about Muslim Americans after this nationally televised speech, and you saw that um, just about all of them dropped. This really does show the power of these new big data sources when you have minute by minute searches. Uh, uh, that you can actually turn something as seemingly as chaotic as how to calm an angry mob into a real science. And I think you're going to be seeing that in more and more areas uh, where we really haven't known the answers. We've just been appealing to our intuition and kind of patting ourselves on the back with this new data where you have this unprecedented window into the human mind from Google searches. And you have this data in tiny locations minute by minute. Uh, you're going to see more and more areas turned into, uh, turned into real uh, sciences. So that's my book, Everybody Lies. 
uh, you can learn a lot more about this and, and, all, and all my research and, uh, and stuff. And I hope uh, you utilize uh, some of these tools uh, in your work in the future. And now Scott is going to ask some questions, I think. So that, that, that's fascinating. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, when you track racism, do you track it longitudinally? Are we becoming less or more racist since the election? Yeah, so I think actually you haven't seen a big rise in racism. I think, you know, what's happened is a lot of the racism that was underground and always there is becoming yeah. more public, but you haven't seen a big rise. One thing you, you see in this data set is the number of people who make nasty searches is way bigger than the number of people who commit nasty acts. Mm -hmm. So it may be, so like even the kill Muslims thing, uh, there are about 12,000 of those searches every year and there are about 11 murders of Muslim Americans. So like they actually do have predictive power at the city level where you can say, okay, these are high or the national level, they're gonna be high. But the average person making these nasty searches is still very unlikely to commit a crime. And the average probably teenager who's searching I think one of the things we're going to learn is the average teenage, that probably a lot more teenagers search for how to make a dirty bomb or something than we realized, and that it may be less of a predictive mm -hmm. uh, tool than we thought. And we want to be a little careful, not just for ethical or privacy reasons, but just mm -hmm. for data science reasons in kind of intervening uh, when people are having bad thoughts or the suicidal stuff. I think there are 3.5 million searches for suicide every month in the United States, and there are 4,000 suicides. Mm -hmm. So like the number of, so they do have huge predictive power at the area level. But it's still true that the average person who makes this search is very, very unlikely to actually commit suicide. So you don't want to like be knocking on people's doors, being like putting them in mental hospitals because they search how to kill yourself mm -hmm. uh, on, on Google. So your greed glands get going around this because you start to think about: Have you tried to correlate this with when does someone start saying? Have you done searches around buying cryptocurrency and then to see if there's a lag or an impact on search volume around cryptocurrencies and price movements? Done a little bit of that. Uh, so you can usually predict the volume of trading. So, like when people are searching for gold a lot, you know that trading for gold is going to be high, mm -hmm. but you don't know necessarily buy or, if it's buy or sell. So, I mean, that still can be useful. You can make some money on that, but it, it's harder to do the buy and sell. And when so, I think people tend not to search buy gold, they tend to search mm -hmm. gold prices or something else. So, you, so, like the people who search buy gold, it's such a rare search that it doesn't have as much predictive power. Could you use this type of data to predict what were, or highlight what would be the best places to build new stores? Yeah, definitely. I think another thing you can do, which I talk about in my book, is there's this concept of a doppelganger search, mm -hmm. which I find which is really powerful in data science. So the way I first learned about it was Nate Silver, before he's predicted politics, predicted athletes. And his predictive model for athletes was way better than everybody else's. He would analyze baseball players. He'd find the, the most similar players to them on that current trajectory, and then say, how did those players do in the future? Mm -hmm. So if you have like David Ortiz at 31 years old, you say, what, did, what were David Ortiz, find David Ortiz doppelgangers up until that point, when mm -hmm. they were, you know, until they were 31, and see how they did in the next three years, and, see, and then kind of make that prediction based on that. And what you could do with opening up a store is you can say, here is where our stores are most effective. Let's find the city doppelgangers, basically. And, it's, and I think co companies do that a little bit, but they're limited by census data, which only gives very, very limited variables on it. But with Google search data, you have so many more variables where you can say, uh, where you can get a much better predictor of like uh, what your city, your successful cities have in common and where there are other cities or towns uh, or blocks that have uh, similarities. So how do you control for searches where people are just expressing their curiosity versus actual intent? Yeah, so I don't, that's a really good question. I don't really, at this point, I don't know. Like if you had individual level data, you could probably get a better sense of what's just a curious search and what's like a real search, like a, like a real meaningful search. So I definitely, when I was doing this research, made a lot of really, really nasty searches uh, and actually didn't get a knock on the door from the FBI. FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> it's kind of interesting, but, uh, but like I made those race, those particular racist searches, I made them because I'm like, you know, I wanted to know what came up and, and how you can analyze the data. So that would go into the data set. Uh, I think that's a smaller percent of searches than people probably think, uh, which is why the data correlates so strongly over and over again. So it can kind of uh, handle a little bit of noise and a little bit of curiosity searches and a little bit of researchers or, or other mm -hmm. factors. But the overwhelming reason that people make a search is not for that uh, kind of curiosity or research, but it's because they actually are expressing some sort of attitude.
So on Facebook, it's not people, it's their representative. And when they're on Google, it's who they actually are. Have you seen any sort of screening or starching of people's intentions when they do searches via voice as opposed to actually uh, I haven't seen that. It would, be, it would be interesting. You could imagine that people would be less likely to express uncomfortable things on, on voice. There is also, I just kind of assume that Google searches are always going to be the most honest data source, uh, and people mm -hmm. are always honest. And when I first gave this talk, you know, I was doing this research about five years ago, everyone just like laughed and like, oh, of course, Google, everyone's so honest on Google. And now some people, are, people don't have, some people don't have that like gut reaction of like, I'm so honest on Google. They're like, I don't tell Google everything. Like I'm, I'm a little more cautious because of some of the things of the, the government knocking on your door. And someone actually did a study after Edward Snowden's revelations where they looked at some of these sensitive searches and they saw that there was about a 4% drop in uh, kind of searches that people wouldn't want other people to know they were making. So mm -hmm. searches for like whatever, you know, how to make a bomb, or right? all these searches kind of drop out 4% after Edward Snowden's uh, revelation. So I think there are, you know, people do respond a little bit to, uh, you know, to privacy and stuff. Uh, actually, the favorite, my favorite part of that study is they had to figure out what's an embarrassing search. So they used Amazon Turk, and they just gave people a list, like gave users a list of searches uh, and, said, and asked them to rank how embarrassing the search was. And like most of them are how to kill a bomb or like embarrassing sexual stuff or whatever, anything, you, health conditions, anything you expect, but right up there at the top, uh, for, for embarrassing searches, according to Amazon Turk people, was Nickelback, the band. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually do see, like, just as there was a drop for sexual stuff and health conditions, and there was also a drop for Nickelback searches after Snowden's revelation. So, uh. Uh, so la just last question: What? Um, that's that's not embarrassment. That's just common sense. Uh, what? Uh, what's the most counterintuitive finding across your research? Uh, I think just everything. Like, I think. Uh, I kind of talk about in the book how my intuition is just always wrong. So like the racism map was counterintuitive to me. I didn't think that that would be the map of racism. You know, I've done a map of anxiety in the United States. I would have thought anxiety would be highest in New York City, like overeducated intellectuals is not true. Anxiety is highest in rural areas, places with lower levels of education. It's higher in upstate New York than, uh, than New York City. So over and over again, you kind of build a model of how the world works based on your intuition and your life experiences, and then you go to the data, and it's totally opposite from that. So. Seth, thanks for your good work. Thanks yeah. for sharing it. All right. Tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies.